My name is Kirby Bartholomew. I'm the chairman of the uh, Venture Lab program of MIT Enterprise Forum. This is our first program for the 2015-2016 uh, season. And we've got, uh, as some of you have known, this. we have two programs. One's the Enterprise Forum program, which is typically is focused more on technology. And this program is the Venture Lab program, where it's focused more on educating and uh, providing uh, entrepreneurs with the information they need to get companies started. Uh, MIT Enterprise Forum is sponsored by the MIT Technology Review, so we are loosely associated with the Massachusetts Institute of, Tech Institute of Technology, and the mission of the Enterprise Inst Forum worldwide is to, uh, what's the, inform, connect, coach technology entrepreneurs and enabling them to rapidly transform ideas into world-changing companies. So that's the official, <laughs> official mission statement of the uh, Enterprise Forum. For tonight, we've got uh, like an all-star cast up here of folks from the startup community, and we're going to uh, spend some time here talking about, we're going to start out with a little bit of uh, back and forth. Starting out here on the first side, we've got Adam Schuster, who's going to be the moderator. He's standing up there in the bright lights. Next to him is Sanjay Puri from Nine Mile Labs, <coughs> Rebecca Lovell from the city of Seattle, uh, Elizabeth Scallon from <laughs> the University of Washington, and on the end we've got Hannon Levy, who's Levy, Lavi, yep. who's brand new in town, has a great foreign uh, background, came from Israel. He's with Microsoft, so I'm going to let them. Talk. They're going to talk, introduce themselves and their programs here in a little bit later. But I thought I'd just kind of lay it out for you, so you know who these people on this, perched on the stools up here. But uh, to get it started, uh, where we're going to start with. Rebecca is going to come up and talk a little bit, I think, about kind of the, she's, Rebecca has this great overview of the startup community. Most of you are technology entrepreneurs, and so it should not be any surprise that we have in Seattle, in greater Seattle, an incredibly vibrant ecosystem, and there's so many ways to measure it. One of the things that we certainly track as a city is really the economic impact of new business. And for those of you who are in startup, I can tell you that it's new business, so those that were started within the last five years, much more so than small business or even big business that are the net job creators in our economy. So you are really driving forward the growth and innovation um, in our region. Last year in 2014, we had a wildly record-breaking year in terms of investment dollars that flowed into Seattle startups. And combining both the IT and the life sciences sector, sort of a, a couple of gems of our innovation economy, we pulled in $1.5 billion. So about 20, amazing, about 20 life science deals, uh, 130 in IT, about equally matched in terms of funding, but this is just one small indicator of the level up of activity that really has been kind of on the rise in the last five years. 2008, not such a good year, but we've absolutely been on the recovery road since then. Just to give you a little context for how we're doing. And we have had an absolute explosion of resources available to entrepreneurs. You know, I'm going to maybe do more of a little Vanna White over here. And can you hear me okay? Yep. <laughs> yeah? Is that all right? Take the mic. Can you hear me now? All right, great. So um, this might look like a little bit of logo and alphabet soup, but what I'm trying to convey here is that we have a whole host of resources for the entire life cycle of doing a startup. Um, so if you have an idea or maybe you have a day job and you just want to scratch the startup itch, you can participate in a startup weekend, a 54-hour uh, marathon of coding and team building where you launch an idea or a company. Um, and there's so many things you can do thereafter if you're really looking to up your technical acumen. Um, in addition to the University of Washington, we've got a lot of really wonderful sort of post-secondary educational opportunities to help us bolster that talent pipeline in computer science and engineering specifically. Ada Developers Academy is a tuition-free programming school for women who are career changing. Really amazing, uh, both, both uh, education and uh, mentorship and internships. Code Fellows General Assembly um, and Galvanize now are offering kind of three to six months courses and and you know, full stack development to data science and everything in between. Um, Code.org. This is I just think it's it's one of sort of Seattle's um, you know shining stars. They are headquartered here, and their mission is to allow everyone across the globe, kids and adults aged seven to seventy, to learn how to code. And so they actually pay teachers a stipend to learn how to deliver computer science curriculum in every school imaginable. And they're from Seattle. We've got so much innovation that was born here. Um, really exciting stuff. Um, 
Um, as you're sort of navigating the ecosystem, and we're certainly going to talk about that as a, as a panel and, and with you um, as part of this conversation, there's some really great events where you can network, you can kind of take some educational programming, MIT Enterprise Forum, certainly you're here tonight. Who's um, here for the first time? First MIT, awesome. Right on, great. So you've already found this resource. Washington Technology uh, Industry Association is really kind of statewide. They do a lot of networking and education events and sort of represent the tech community in Olympia. Student R&D, I didn't even know you were gonna be here and I put you on the slide. Yeah, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this later, but it's really about kind of engaging high school students in entrepreneurship and technology. Really amazing work in the community. Technology Alliance in a similar space as WTIA. The list goes on and on. And by the way, not to roll the promotional video, for our program, but um, on the Startup Seattle website, we have over 150 resources in 14 different categories just for you. And so I've just sort of chosen a few to give you a sense of, um, again, the array of resources. Um, you know, networking events, making connections is one of the most important things that you can do. Entrepreneurship can be really lonely. And so I think it's, it's fun and reassuring to be alone together. And you never know uh, what kind of serendipitous connections you can meet whether they're your next customer or investor or business partner. Um, so in addition to MIT Enterprise Forum, there's some great monthly sort of fireside chat events like Startup Grind. There's an event actually going on right now, New Tech Seattle. They also have an east side chapter, several hundred folks from startup through established tech kind of networking and pitching their businesses to each other. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the government actually is starting to support uh, startups as of a year and a half ago through our Startup Seattle program. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I've got a whole host of resources actually on the website that it's, it's hard to sort of put them in one category. So GeekWire, also born in Seattle, um, not just a news source, but it's really about kind of creating community and helping put Seattle on the map of global innovation in a place where I suspect we all believe it really belongs. Um, so GeekWire, PJ Sound Business Journal, Tech Flash, Seattle Times just hired a technology reporter. It's kind of exciting to see that, you know, even traditional media is picking up on the fact that tech is hot. And, uh, and booming right now, so thank you for mentioning that. But again, all of that and more on, on our website. Where I think we're probably gonna focus our conversation tonight, sir, moderator, is, is in this space. And um, when it comes to when you're really gonna get serious about your business, you're getting out of that idea and experimentation stage, there are some great sort of categories of resources that you can avail yourself of. Um, the first sort of broad category is co-working space. And that's more than just um, office space in the traditional uh, sense of it, they're really about curated communities, right? So we're not looking for homogenous communities, but communities where the members have something in common. They share some kind of a passion. And so you're typically renting some flexible office space, whether you're there every day uh, or just once a week. Um, but, but here's a few examples. Impact Hub, Think Space, we work. Um, Surf Incubator, we're going to talk about in a second, Seton. Uh, but the idea with Impact Hub, their their connective tissue is social entrepreneurship. Think Space, you know, really focuses on the technology space. We work as a community of digital creatives. And it's really about creating some density for all of you who are going about this sort of lonely work. Um, and again, you have those water cooler or kegerator conversations that can be really fruitful for your business. So, um, so that's sort of one category. As you start to enrich the resources around just physical space and community, we kind of shift into the incubator space. So spaces and programs like Surf Incubator and Startup Hall and Galvanize sort of start with the co-working physical shared space is kind of their minimum viable product, but they layer in programming, whether it's educational programming or community events, uh, and additional resources, folks who come in um, from you know, a whole set of professional services and, and offer free resources and advice and office hours, those are often features of incubator spaces. Um, and then, as we layer in kind of even more mentorship and programming, we shift into the uh, accelerator space. And it's exactly what you think it might be. Uh, they're designed to accelerate your progress as an entrepreneur. And so take all of those resources. It's typically cohort-based education where you're going through a program with another, of, uh, you know, a number of other entrepreneurs. Um, you're getting financial resources. You're, they're typically mentor-driven programs, and you'll learn more about that here. Um, 
and they really, you know, in three to five months are accelerating your path um, typically to financing and customer acquisition. So really great stuff there. Um, even before, uh, so, so even before you get into kind of the accelerator space, there's a couple of other stops along the way. The next program, which was born out of kind of startup weekend, um, is billed as a pre-accelerator program. So before you're ready for an accelerator, it helps you think about how you're going to acquire customers and validate your market. Founder Institute, another accelerator. For those of us who haven't quit our day jobs yet, but we're kind of the weekend warriors and, and working on our projects um, outside of work, and it helps us decide whether or not our business plan holds water and we could quit that day job and really pursue the startup dream full time. And then here tonight, you're gonna meet some folks from Microsoft uh, Ventures and Nine Mile Labs, which are that kind of accelerator model that provide all of those resources and again, kind of access to, to capital as well. So that was just a very quick overview. I think we're gonna dive into this space a little bit more deeply with the actual subject matter experts who are here today. But I sort of wanted to give you the third party, you know, I'm Switzerland, I'm neutral, I'm from the city, um, kind of overview of the landscape. And so with that, I will get back to my seat as a panelist and thank you. Wow, that was a great introduction. Uh, it, it sounds like a, a lot of hands went up when uh, a lot of people here are involved in startups. Uh, some people here are involved in some of the organizations that we saw on, on the board. How many people here uh, just saw uh, or just learned about a new organization or a new program that they, they weren't, uh, weren't aware of before? Okay, so a decent amount. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's great about Seattle is the, the plethora of, of different resources that there are out there, and that's what we're here to explore tonight. So um, thank you for that great introduction. I think that uh, to, to just give a brief overview of the format tonight, we're going to um, have about uh, 45 minutes of general panel discussion. We're going to open it up to questions and answers for about 30 minutes, and then there'll be a short uh, open networking portion at the end of it. So uh, you can get to meet some of the panelists afterwards. Um, let's start by actually having, um, getting a little bit more uh, of background on each of our panelists. So if you guys don't mind going down the line and just describing um, your role at the organization and maybe um, a little bit about what drew you into working with startups in the first place. Sure. Um, I can start. Is this working? Okay, um, so I'm Sanjay Puri. I'm one of the three co-founders uh, and partners at Nine Mile Labs. Um, just about my background right now, and we'll describe Nine Mile Labs later. Is that okay? No, no, please, please uh, give, okay. give a little overview. So uh, quickly about my background. Um, but the first part of my career was primarily as a technologist, as an engineer. I ran engineering teams as part of large companies, as part of consulting teams. Um, I ran an engineering team at Microsoft, uh, I'm sorry, at Oracle. Um, after that stint as an engineering manager, um, I, I started a company. Um, then decided to go to business school and went off to the dark side. I uh, joined Microsoft right after that. I spent about five years there um, and um, uh, you know, learned a tremendous amount in marketing at Microsoft. I really believe that my Microsoft is one of the best marketing uh, organizations in the world. But that aside, um, uh, then decided that I needed to move to the startup uh, world and joined a little startup uh, based out of Bellevue <laughs> which uh, quickly got acquired about a couple of times, uh, by first by Opsware and then by HP. Uh, and here I was uh, at another large firm. Uh, spent about a painful year uh, at HP and then uh, decided to join a, a, a healthcare software startup. Spent about three years there running marketing for them. Um, and at that point said, okay, we need to do something. Uh, and as, as I started exploring a bunch of things, uh, got together with the two co-founders that I have right now, and uh, what occurred to us was that we had very complementary skills. We really wanted to work together. We had very different skills. Um, one of my co-founders is a hardcore hustler. He's a sales guy, a phenomenal um, uh, entrepreneur. He's a serial entrepreneur, has never worked in a large company. The second co-founder is, again, very similar in the sense that he's done like five startups, two exits, uh, never worked in a large company. Um, but a technical guy, the other guy is a sales guy, and I'm like product and marketing guy. And we found this, this real interesting synergy uh, uh, with respect to our skills. And as we started exploring opportunities, we found that startups needed those skills. Startup need, startups wanted to get the benefit of the kinds of skills we had. 
and we try to help startups in in few different ways in one of ways and what became clear to us that we had to figure out a scalable way of doing it and clearly startups are short in cash they cannot pay us so what is the currency they have turns out it's equity and as we started exploring different business models around how we can help startups uh, the accelerator model just turned out to be a fabulous way of building a scalable way of helping helping companies and the way accelerators work, and that brings to our business model currently, is um, Nine Mile Labs is an enterprise B2B um, accelerator, which means that we focus on companies that generate their revenue from other businesses. We don't do consumer startups. Um, uh, we run a four-month program, and as part of that program, we invest up to $105,000 in companies, and I'll describe how we uh, make that investment. We invest up to $105,000, we provide the companies workspace and we currently lease space from Surf Incubator and Seton back there has been a, has been a huge supporter and a great uh, partner in this uh, two and a half year journey so far. Um, so we uh, provide them workspace. We have a very structured curriculum, the kind of curriculum that uh, most startups typically are blind to. As individuals as, uh, and as professionals, what we tend to do is we continue to work on the things that we enjoy and love and then the things that we don't like or we are not good at, we try to procrastinate on those. And what we try and do is run the structured curriculum that allows for these blind spots to go away. We push the companies extremely hard, especially in areas that we know that they're going to be deficient at. And a lot of the companies that we see, a lot of the startups, typically need help on marketing, biz dev, sales. Those are the typical disciplines that they need help on, and others too. Um, and then uh, we run the curriculum, and we have a deep mentorship model. What that implies is every startup gets three mentors. Each mentor um, has committed to spend at least an hour a week with the, with the companies. And what that allows for is deep, engaged mentoring rather than the flyby mentoring model that you'll see, uh, that, that some of us see in a lot of places. Anyway, um, and then we uh, introduce the companies to investors. Um, we fo focus very hard on getting customer traction, which means rapid and exponential customer traction. That's what is important for a startup. And then finally, we have a demo day. There's about 500 or 600 people in a large venue such as Washington State Convention Center or Showbox Soto. Um, and the idea is to celebrate the launch of these companies into the community. So that's what Nine Mile Labs does. Uh, a quick word about the, uh, uh, the, um, about the funding. We, um, the, as startups enter into the program, there's about nine to 10 startups typically uh, in every batch of uh, four months. Every startup receives $35,000. And then um, we also, uh, as they enter the program for the first two, within the first two to three weeks, we define metrics that will allow them to get the next two tranches of $35,000 each. And as they achieve those metrics, we make those investments, and of course, the startups have the option to um, to accept or not accept. So that was a very long drawn description of what <laughs> I did and what Nine Mile Labs does. And now I'll hand it off to Rebecca. Sure. Fantastic, Rebecca. Can you um, describe a little bit about um, your your brand new role and uh, and what that means? Sure. Um, yes, I can. So as of uh, eight days ago, I was the first startup advocate for the city of Seattle. As of seven days ago, I'm the first director of entrepreneurship and industry. Um, I'm relatively new to government. This is about an 18 month journey for me. Um, but I've been in the space for about 10 years. So went to grad school to kind of do some career changing, which many of us do. Went to UW, by the way, I should say right now and disclose, I love each of these equally. I'm a, I'm a husband for grad school and I taught there for seven years, a class on venture capital investing. I'm a mentor at the Microsoft Venture Accelerator as well as Nine Mile Labs, so they're all fabulous equally yet differently. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, um, so with the city, um, we, uh, we launched the Startup Advocate Program, Startup Seattle, as I mentioned in, in the overview, where our goal really is to, um, to be a hub of resources for technology entrepreneurs and to speed your path, hopefully to success. We know it's a bumpy road. Um, we run the Startup Seattle website. I have held office hours at Surf Incubator. We work Galvanize, Impact Hub, Startup Hall to make 
make myself available to the community and really kind of triage what their problems are. I'm more with the, the I think Sanjay just described as the flyby mentor. <laughs> so, but as a city, our goal is to really kind of scale our impact and, and sort of touch as many entrepreneurs as we can. Um, we also very much focus on youth engagement and reversing the historic underrepresentation of women and people of color in our wonderful and booming tech sector. So we, our lens is shared prosperity. Um, so with that in mind, we kind of, we're, I'm building as we speak a new team um, that represents most of our key industry sectors as a city. So certainly tech and startup tech, manufacturing, maritime, clean tech, life sciences, green business, restaurant. Uh, we'll also support the film and music office and do some really geeky kind of data research so we can be excellent communicators of the Seattle story and do real data-driven storytelling um, and help bolster our local economy and sort of, you know, again, even like the GeekWire mission, put Seattle on the map of global innovation. So just a really quick personal background. Um, I have worked in private sector, in corporate, run startups, in nonprofit, in academia, and now government. And so clearly the business entity doesn't matter to me. The common thread is really um, mission-driven. Um, and I love working with entrepreneurs who are passionate and, you know, it might sound cliche, but really want to make a dent on the world and create jobs and create opportunity, and that gets me out of bed every single day. Um, and what's great about working for the city is, unlike being a CEO where you spend half your time raising money, um, I actually just get to do the work. Maybe take, take one or two more meetings than I might like, but I just get to do the work all the time um, and really sort of pull big levers of social change around education and opportunity. So awesome, awesome stuff. Um, I think that's probably all for now, and I can't wait to get into the dialogue portion of the panel. It must be very hard to do your job being so shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of UW, go Huskies. We've got Elizabeth here, who's very deeply embedded in uh, the Co-Motion Accelerator and UW in general, so, or Incubator, I'm sorry. Yeah. Please, uh, please give us a little bit of uh, background about that. Perfect. Um, so you can hear me. Perfect. Uh, so uh, earlier this year, Co-Motion actually became a new entity. So we were originally Center for Commercialization. Um, so we have a new name change. So a lot of people are like, well, what does that mean? And what our new focus is, instead of just tech transfer, and that's what we were in like the 80s, right? All about licensing. And then in the 90s and in the early 2000s, we decided uh, to really focus in on creating startups. Well, with our new name and our new mission, it's about um, actually creating that innovation mindset. Set. Uh, so that's actually been really fun. So it's all about collaborative motion moving together uh, and creating that innovation uh, across campus. And not just across campus at UW Seattle, but across UW Bothell and UW Tacoma, and of course, uh, connecting in with all of our global partners as well. So here at the Incubator, we do a lot of really fun events. Uh, we do programming where we bring in um, some uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and connect them into different resources and have have a workshop and, uh, and then we also do CEO roundtables. We also house, um, we're the only multi-discipline um, incubator in Seattle. So Seattle has about 40 incubator co-working accelerators in town, but we're the only one that has office, wet lab, uh, maker space, dry lab uh, in the city. And so it's really fun to have all these different industries being able to collaborate and um, connect with each other. Um, so uh, my background is that I have an undergrad in biochemistry and humanities, and then I got my graduate uh, degree in global business. So I've always been kind of interested in the tech fields and really interested in uh, connecting different communities all over um, and, and through that innovation lens. I just want to brag for you for a second <laughs> so you don't have to. So in case you missed it, Reuters just um, rated the University of Washington as number four in terms of global innovation. And CoMotion was hugely featured in that decision. So congratulations. And with this new administration, at, yeah, that was great. And you know the advent of CoMotion, we really have seen the sort of walled garden of the university start to dissolve and a really purposeful effort to connect um, the researchers, students, professors with entrepreneurs and investors and community. And so you see a real permeable membrane between the university and the community and it's awesome. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, the UW has so many fantastic resources. It's great to see that you guys are able to pull those together and leverage them so well. 
Yeah, and I think there's just so much more to come. Um, so we're really excited about the upcoming season. Um, so in uh, just in about two weeks, we also will be launching our incubator working sessions where we'll bring in entrepreneurs to come in to give uh, quick little working sessions, about 20 minute overview lecture on a different topic, lean canvas marketing, et cetera. And then we'll have three hours open where anyone in the community to come in and connect in with our entrepreneurs and our residents, our mentors. And um, so you'll always have a place to know where the commercialization is going to be happening happening. Um, so we can have students come in, uh, different teams, but that's open not only to the incubator and the UW startup teams, but the teams at uh, Startup Hall and just also in the community. So um, check out our website, comotion, um, uh, yeah, dot, uh, UW edu, and look at uh, for our events and ways to connect in with us. Thank you. Uh, now, I'm not sure about Sanjay. I know Rebecca and Elizabeth, you guys are both uh, Seattle natives, uh, originated here. Uh, Hanan is definitely not. He comes <laughs> from by way of Tel Aviv. And maybe you can talk to us a little bit about Microsoft Ventures and then what made you um, want to make that very significant move. Yeah, definitely. So I'll start with a short background about myself. Uh, I started to code at the age of 10. Um, I was a geek uh, before it was uh, really in, in a fashion to be a geek. <laughs> um, and then I sold software at the age of 12. Um, since then I've been all around, uh, I happen to be uh, the first airborne programmer in the Israeli Air Force. Uh, all these kind of uh, amazing stuff that technology can bring. Um, and uh, eventually I studied computer science and business administration uh, in the Hebrew University, Jerusalem. Uh, finished it after two years and then on my third year when I wanted to go to an accelerated PhD, uh, my professor said, uh, why do you need this nonsense? Uh, go and open a startup with me. Uh, we'll do a lot of fun and money and you know, it was the dot com kind of times. So I decided, okay, let's do it. Um, and um, it was quite an interesting time, if you remember, that was uh, around uh, 98, so it was the bubble time. Um, I worked seven days a week, um, 15 hours a day for seven months, and we raised $10 million as seed round, um, which is un unheard of today. Um, totally we raised $60 million. We had um, a nice company of 140 people with offices here in the US. Um, and then we blew up together with the with the bubble. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I learned uh, a little bit about uh, about that. Uh, eventually, by the way, the company was uh, uh, was acquired. Uh, we haven't seen anything from that because the investors took uh, uh, all that money. But that's okay. You know, we, we learned we learned a lot. Um, then I moved to a company called Mercury Interactive. I don't know if you know that company. Uh, I joined it when it was a one million dollar revenue company. Uh, in three and a half years, it was a you know a pretty sizable company. In three and a half years, uh, we grew up to be a one billion dollar company, and then we were acquired by HP. And after one and a half painful years in HP, I left as well. Mm -hmm. So you remember we were there at the same time when Sunny, Sunny, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the reason we're here, <laughs> to know each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the HP refugees, yeah. So after one half years in HP, um, I quit and opened another startup um, around kids' safety on the web. Uh, we had some great technology, we raised some money, um, and uh, after four years, um, I decided with my partner to uh, to stop the company with the money in the bank. We uh, we thought it's not going anywhere, so we wanted to give the money back to the investors. They were really mad on us. Uh, really, you know, uh, you know it. Uh, for the entrepreneurs, you know what investors can do for you, can do to you, uh, you know, in a hard, tough board meetings. Uh, but eventually, we quit. They put more money in the company. They brought new CEO, new CDO. Um, and I'm still a shareholder there. Uh, fortunately, I'm I'm not in the board, just shareholder, so I don't have the headache. I now can be, you know, the one that complains. Uh, <laughs> um, so I've been in this position. Um, and about that time, um, someone from Microsoft in Tel Aviv called me and told me, "Okay, we're opening an accelerator uh, in April." That was in January when I quit my last startup. 
uh, and you have the right background. You have an entrepreneurial background, you have a technology background, which is the DNA of Microsoft. You've been in a small company, it's big companies. Uh, why won't you join us? And I, with the memories of HP, I said, no more, I, I can't go into a corporate again. Uh, but you know, uh, he convinced me to, to, to come to the interview and I learned it's going to be a startup within a company um, because I learned we're going to be the first one in the world so there was nothing really to learn from other than uh, web sources, you know, YC and, and Techstars. Um, and it looked nice to me, but um, so they lined up all the interviews in one day. Uh, at the end of that day, they said, okay, you're in. And I said, uh, thank you very much, but uh, uh, after this six months with my board of directors of my previous startup, I promised my family that we're going to take a few months vacation in New Zealand. Uh, so thanks again. I'll be happy to meet you in Merich after my vacation in New Zealand. And they said, uh, my boss said, uh, we're not going to wait for you. And I said, I'm going to New Zealand. That's your decision if you're going to wait for me or not. <laughs> um, so I went to New Zealand, uh, an amazing trip. Uh, if you haven't been there, go there, <laughs> really. Uh, a life-changing trip. I went back. Uh, I called the day I landed. I called my, um, my boss and said, ask him if it's still relevant. He said, uh, we extended an offer to someone, but if you're really serious, uh, we're willing to pull it back, give it to you. Uh, we really liked you. Uh, so the day after I went to an interview, he saw I'm a serious guy, uh, and you know the rest is history. So that happens three and a half years ago. I joined Microsoft in March 2012, uh, actually 25th of March 2012, and uh, 22nd of April, there was a date in the calendar, yeah, that we had to start the accelerator in there. So we had really virtually no time to, to prepare um, um, for those who have been in Microsoft, I, I was told that everyone in Seattle is either before Microsoft, after Microsoft, or during Microsoft. So, <laughs> uh, so for those who have been in Microsoft, there is a new, a new employee orientation uh, that you have to take once you join a company. Uh, so I somehow skipped that because I needed like every minute there. Uh, so the NEO in here when I joined Redmond was the first one for me after three and a half years in a company. Um, I joined a company, uh, it was an exciting journey. I thought I'm, I'm not going to stay there for more than two years, you know, establishing a startup, getting to know the corporate, and then leaving because it's going to be probably like HP. Apparently, <laughs> apparently I stayed, uh, and I took a larger commitment uh, relocating over here with my family. Um, uh, over here, uh, it's, a, it's another adventure for us. Uh, I sold it to my to my wife and to my kids. That's the new. I, I told them that Seattle area is the New Zealand of the U.S. So, <laughs> which is really true. You know, I've been here for a lot of times, and it's so green and so nice and so rainy, uh, like like New Zealand. So, uh, um, so they came over here. My wife quit her job. She's a physician in Israel. She can't. Uh, you know, it's hard for her to get licenses here. Uh, but we're all happy for the last two months. Um, I hope we'll be happy, uh, you know, more than just two months. But so far, so good. Um, Slightly different climate here in Seattle <laughs> than, than yeah, Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, um, I'm running the Microsoft Ventures Accelerator in here. We have, after the Tel Aviv uh, one succeeded, we've cloned the model to India and China, and then to Europe, to Berlin, London, and Paris. Uh, and recently, a year ago, we have uh, decided to start the accelerator in here. Um, we've had already two programs running in here, um, and now we're getting prepared for, our, for the third one that will start in uh, February. Um, the program is a four-month program in which we take 10 to 15 companies to work with us. Um, our acceptance rate is around 2 to 3 percent, so we had last time 500 companies apply and uh, we got in only 14. Um, it's a non-equity program, so we don't invest money in the companies and we don't take anything from the company, so we don't take any payment or any equity or any rights uh, for first refusal for uh, any kind of future investments or so. Uh, we take all companies in the software uh, domain, so we're not into biotech because we, we don't believe we can really help companies in, in biotech and, you know, heavy hardware, but anything with software um, we can help with. 
Um, there is a bias of companies applying to our program to be B2B rather than anything else, um, but we accept any, any kind of company. For the next batch, uh, will be around machine learning, so everything around machine learning uh, is relevant. Um, program is heavily mentored, um, as you heard um, from my colleagues here. Um, I think the number one value that we bring to the entrepreneurs and to the startups is our connections to the market. Um, Microsoft is very much connected to any kind of enterprise you may think about. Um, we have a lot of uh, executive briefings in the campus, so we go there and talk about innovation and we bring startups with us to be exposed to these, uh, uh, to these executives and then we create these kind of connections. Uh, we have partners day and we have demo day to which we bring partners. So we make all these kind of events for mentors, for ecosystem players, for partners and customers. Uh, eventually for the startups, and uh, this morning I met uh, uh, Brad, the one of the founders of Ignition, and he asked me what happens if there is a contradiction or a, a conflict of interest between uh, your interest in the startups and your interest in the company. For example, if you want to help startups uh, recruit people, recruit engineers, probably Microsoft would like to recruit them. So in my position, I'm always for the startups. Uh, and when I know I do my job right, is when I get complaints for, from CVPs in the company that I'm not doing my job right, okay? <laughs> uh, because I expect a Microsoft employee to act differently. So when startups know that and realize that, and they do it pretty quickly, uh, they put a lot of faith in our help, and uh, uh, eventually um, we can help them with that. Uh, one last thing, uh, we give the startups uh, um, the software uh, for free, uh, the cloud, and uh, all the, the other software of Microsoft as part of the BizPark uh, programs. Uh, we partner with all the rest of the accelerators, so we're good partners with Nine Mile Labs and many other with Techstars, with YC, with you know many, many, many accelerators all around the country and the world. Uh, so we don't see ourselves as competitors to any one of them, but as partners. Um, we just increase the value of startups. We do not take anything and we increase the value. So actually Sanjay and I already talked about uh, deal flow sharing and all this kind of stuff that we do with anyone else. Um, um, we're totally into partnership and synergies and, and I think that's the most important thing to understand about our program. That was actually one of the questions that I wanted to highlight. Um, you know, Sanjay, you already mentioned that you work with Surf. There's a very there's a very good synergy there. Hanan, it sounds like you don't really view. I mean, would the rest of the panel agree that um, typically most accelerators, incubators, co-working spaces, they're not very competitive. They, that they actually can be very good collaborative partners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, we partner with Cambia Grove. Um, I know we are also working with Microsoft Ventures, uh, Nine Mile Labs. I mean, we definitely look at how can we together be more effective and have a higher impact, and how can we serve our community better? That's the entrepreneurs, the mentors, the, um, the entire group, the, our partnership. So definitely looking for that collaboration, those bridges, and ways to have a higher impact um, in all the different ways. So. Yeah, and I think that is part of the magic of the Seattle ecosystem. The the Seattle nice reputation is a real thing. I mean, I really do believe there is an authentic undercurrent of collegiality. And frankly, as we get critical mass, you know, whether it's 35 co-working spaces or nine angel groups or 10 venture funds, you know, and, and all the sort of incubators and accelerators um, that attracts, you know, talent to Seattle. We all, you know, the rising tide raises all ships. That's, I think, a real phenomenon. The other thing, too, is that each one of these programs has its own niche in the universe, whether it's carving out an industry space, like Nine Mile Labs is uniquely positioned as the enterprise acceler accelerator focusing on B2B. Um, Techstars has evolved, but I, I think that you know it can be either sort of sector specific or stage specific. Founder Institute is almost kind of a pre-qualifier as well as the next program. And after you pass through those, you may be a great candidate for some of these other accelerators. So I think it makes a lot of sense for them to compare notes and say, gosh, they weren't ready for our program, but yours would be great. Or wow, they weren't fit a f they weren't a fit for nine mile, but sounds great, you know, for machine learning, what have you. So so again, I think we all win when we work together, not to be too kumbaya, but it's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Just, uh, just one more thing. Uh, just to be clear, we will compete for specific <laughs> startups. 
Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, from uh, from our perspective, you know, we will compete with tech stars, and 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 that is completely natural. However, the perspective to take there is that as long as you believe in the opportunity in the Seattle area, and we are huge believers in that, the amount of talent we have, the amount of technology skills, both on the technology side as well as the business side, um, there is. The more, peop the more entrepreneurs we see in the ecosystem, the more people we see coming out of the woodwork and wanting to start companies, whether they go to Nine Mile Labs or Techstars or Microsoft Ventures, I don't think there's an issue. I think, back to Rebecca's point, a rising tide lifts all, and you have to take that perspective. Compete hard, collaborate beautifully, and we do collaborate together, but uh, at the end of the day, um, as long as we are all supporting startups and, and trying to help entrepreneurs, the rising tide will dissolve. Certain accelerators uh, put investment into the companies, some don't. Uh, but how many accelerators uh, are really focused? Is it very typical for accelerators to be focused with a, a large demo day and investors at the end of the tunnel? Or do some programs exist that are really just more about accelerating the, or you know, fine tuning the business itself? And it's, n it's a little bit detached from the actual you know, end result of investors. From, from where I'm sitting as a totally objective <laughs> observer, <laughs> um, I, I do think that, you know, the nature of enterprise business is different where I, I guess the best form of fundraising with an enterprise uh, opportunity is customer revenue, right? So I've seen with Nine Mile Labs a unique and important and obsessive focus on customer development. So yes, investment is sort of part of the end goal, but I think that what they, their sort of differentiator in the marketplace is this really obsessive focus on customer development. With, with Techstars, you know, and I've been a mentor there now for going on year six, um, they seem to be taking kind of later and later stage companies, and by the time demo day rolls around, many of them already have their funding rounds filled because they are obsessively focused on getting those companies funded even during the program itself. And so there's a different curriculum a different focus and I think part of that is because of the the industry verticals they're in and what the success factors are in terms of really getting these companies off the ground um, I think it's a it's a great question because we see investors again all around the world that are a little bit fed up from demo days so th they have too many demo days um, and they want to see something something a little different so um, they would like to know who the companies are before demo day. Um, so for the demo days, they may come for the event and for the party. Um, but we need to remember that demo day itself has some other um, other objectives. F so for the companies, it's a it's the graduation day. You know, it's a day that they'll need to show something working or something to to get ready to a pitch. And they work really, really hard to do it. It's like a deadline for them. They can't go on a stage with 500 people and, and you know uh, talk nonsense or show nothing. Um, so it pushes them again. It, it accelerates them uh, again. Even if all the investors in the crowd know them and they uh, they are easily reachable, so you know it's not just for them. Um, now another trend that we see is that uh, demo days, um, again, it really depends on the stage of the companies, is built for uh, partners and customers to meet the startups. So uh, they might not be so familiar with the companies. Uh, they don't know exactly what they do. And this is a great opportunity for them to get a quick overview. You know, it won't be, I don't think any kind of uh, sales deal will be signed at the demo day. Uh, but there'll be a, a good starting point for a discussion for the partners and customers with the companies. And that's a great value for the companies. Again, we need to remember, we filter them so much, we train them so much. So a company with a good team, good idea, will probably raise money, you know, unless they are doing something really stupid. Um, so what they need at this point is the traction. They need to to find the right customers. And with the traction, they'll get money. They'll get more money and they'll succeed even more. I mean, one thing I think that's unique about the Microsoft uh, Accelerator program is, you know, let's face it, you have a global reach and pretty deep pockets, even though you're sort of the cowboy doing this entrepreneurial thing. Uh, Microsoft, the Accelerator program, does an amazing job of taking their cohort literally around the world and, and leveraging their global network of partnerships. That's, that's pretty unique, you know? So I, I think every acceler Accelerator program has its own flavor. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to mention three things. 
One, completely agree with Hanan. Um, Demo day is a great forcing function to define a certain set of milestones and going out and achieving them. And when the milestone happens to be going out in front of a bunch of people, hundreds of people, and you know, talking about your company, it helps you think ahead, project yourself ahead, and say, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to present to an audience of 500, 600 people. That's one. Number two, um, we actually um, meet with the companies early on in the first two to three weeks and we define together with them what their milestones need to be and what their uh, definition of success uh, has to be. For some, it's going to be funding. For others, it's going to be customer acquisition. And for yet others, they probably want to continue to build on customer acquisition till much later. And uh, the third thing is, that the one thing we tell our companies is, no investor is going to ever argue with you if you have customer traction, <laughs> okay? You can actually, um, uh, so, so th the way to think about it is um, uh, there are only two people in the world, that's what I, would, I typically tell an entrepreneur, there's only two people in the world who know the value of your product. It's you, the entrepreneur, and your customer, okay? If you go to an investor and tell them, my product is very valuable, will they believe you? Of course not, they don't care. But if your customer is telling the investor and customers are actually voting with their feet and with their dollars, there's no arguments. You can actually win an argument with an investor if you have that customer traction and a rapidly growing customer base. Hence, the focus on customer traction um, and, and that, that transcends investment fads, that transcends any kind of fashion around, hey, consumer startups are the, are the fashion of the day or social or cloud or mobile or whatever else. That's all. That's great. Um, what are, you know, you, you highlighted some of the differences already, but, um, you know, there's, there's so many different types of programs. There's, there's private versus corporate. There's government. Um, there's, uh, you know, industry specific. There's, um, there's audience specific, like whether it's B2B or it's consumer facing. What are, can you guys speak a little bit about what some of the advantages are to, or that you've seen? I know Microsoft uh, Ventures, for example, has done uh, some that are themed and some that are not. Um, you know, what, what has been your experience or what are, what are some of the advantages to doing it one way versus leaving it, to, you know, more open to a wider field? Well, um, I'll just start on this one. Uh, for us, we're at the University of Washington. So all of our startups, about 80% of the startups that are in my incubator have a license with the University of Washington. Um, so we have allowed in uh, a company from Wazoo, uh, you know, so we are building bridges around uh, Washington. And then we also have another small incubator, private incubator, that's also inside of uh, our incubator right now that just moved in. And so what we're looking at is um, both most of the, the value proposition, if you will, for them being here at our incubator is the proximity to campus. So when you're having a company that's spun out from a lab, they can actually walk over to that lab and go talk to that professor. And you know, where that's a five minute walk. It's not across town, it's not across state, uh, it's immediate interaction. And and then also being part of our incubator, they have access to all of the um, cost centers at the University of Washington. So not only do they have to, um, can they walk over and talk to the professor, but then they can also use some of these top um, pieces of equipment that are available at the University of Washington. So this year we actually worked with all the cost centers around UW and created a program where then they can, um, if they're in our incubator, they have immediate access. So they don't have to go set up their own account with them. So uh, for instance, with a biotech company, if you need that $1 million piece of equipment, that mass spec machine, you don't have to go and raise that money. You can save that money by then renting that equipment with the um, with that cost center. So really looking at that partnerships, connecting into the campus, um, and also just being around students too is one of all of our value proposition. Young excitement, um, uh, lots of energy on campus. Uh, it's always interesting right now, we're um, two weeks away from the session to begin and so you can kind of see even when you walk into uh, around campus it's kind of bare and you can kind of tell that people are are getting excited for the fall to come and for the students to return because it's just a vibrancy it's a small little city within the city of Seattle so it's a really cool environment and, um, and yeah it's fun as Nine Mile Labs goes, we made a very deliberate and strategic decision early on uh, to focus on enterprise B2B. Uh, of course, apart from the fact that 
our expertise wa was in that space. There have been a lot of temptations. We've ha uh, seen some great startups, consumer-focused startups. Um, but, uh, you know, at some point you have to figure out what your core competency is about. So that's one. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that everything that we have done around the accelerator is focused on that enterprise B2B um, uh, support, which is the length of the program. We've actually experimented with multiple lengths. Started off with six months, then we uh, 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 compressed it to four months. Um, the mentor pool, we believe that the most important support that an accelerator provides to its companies are the mentors. And that sustained and engaged um, uh, mode of, uh, uh, of help that startups get is what is really useful. So we don't believe that, and then the, in addition to the mentorship, there is the curriculum. If you are going to define a curriculum, you cannot possibly paint all startups with the same brush. You cannot say, I'm going to have the same curriculum for a social-oriented Facebook type of startup as I would for a startup that's focused on freight management. Okay, <laughs> doesn't work that way. And so there was a very deliberate decision to focus. And then, you know, uh, and the last thing is sales and marketing cycles for consumer startups are very different mm -hmm. from enterprise B2B uh, startups. And so if you truly understand those differences, it's hard to convince yourself that, you know, you really want the, you want to have the same level of support. Um, having said that, there are a number of star uh, uh, startup accelerators that are doing a bunch of these and they're doing it phenomenally well. So. But, but for us, it was a very deliberate, it was a very strategic decision to go down in one direction and make sure we build a competency and, uh, and, and expertise around that. Yeah, so uh, just to complement on that, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, we lever the, uh, um, the fact that Microsoft is a global company uh, with all the accelerators, but obviously not just the accelerators, but the reach out of Microsoft uh, all around the world to all these customers. Um, we try to tailor uh, our program to each one of the companies. So I would say like 50% of the program is, is uh, the same for each one of the companies, for, for all the companies together. And uh, the second half is tailored to their stage and tailored to their domain. So um, we try to take companies more or less in the same stage because then it becomes really, really, really tough. Um, but as of domains, uh, we saw 70% of them B2B companies um, and around 30, 25% to 30% um, B2C. Um, our tendency to believe is that um, when there is a good team with some uh, cool technology, um, they don't really know where they are into. Um, the, the, some of them do know, but uh, in the early, early stages, uh, the customer development process will take them into different directions. So even if a company starts B2B, they may end up finding a much bigger pain on the B2C and go into that direction and, and vice versa. So we may encounter this kind of, uh, uh, of things, and that's the reason we're, um, we're taking all these kind of uh, uh, companies, B2B and B2C. Again, companies that apply to Microsoft Ventures Accelerator understand that Microsoft can help them more in the B2B space, and therefore we get more candidates and we select more companies that are in this uh, in this domain but not necessarily yeah, by the way that's a great point that Hanan mentioned which is you start off in one place and you go where your customers take you you don't you don't decide on something and then don't uh, iterate or pivot based on what customers so you you focus in on the feedback from customers customer development and that decides where you are going to end up it seems like that's one of the, the, the biggest advantages that people would get out of these programs is really being able to, you know, you go into it with one idea, uh, but really being able to articulate what where the best plan or path is based on the feedback that you get from your mentors and from your customers. So, One, you know, and absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more with all the benefits and unique differentiators of the programs. Um, there are challenges associated with that and that, um, as each of these folks said, the, the power is really in the mentor network, and so there are many, I mean, dozens, hundreds of us who volunteer our time because we care about the success of the ecosystem in these companies. But the problem with that is that companies get mentor whiplash, right? And so, yes, you want to stay focused on your customer, but it's really easy, you know, to sort of chase the shiny object or whatever the last piece of advice was that you got from mentors. And so, you know, w one of my f sort of favorite phrases that I got from Techstars is, 
is they they tell us as mentors, you know, it's not your company. Like entrepreneurs, it's your company. Um, you're not a bad mentee if you don't take our advice. You know, your job as an entrepreneur is to listen to 100% of it and figure out which 95% to ignore, right? I mean, you still, you have to follow that compass, uh, you know, and balance your, your own convictions and what you're best at the world at and what your customers are telling you. And yes, I'd like to think that mentors were helpful along the way, but, but you know, it's, it's a big responsibility for the CEO and, and founding team. Yeah, and uh, that is exactly why we stay away from the, the flyby model of mentoring. Because what we believe is that mentors are valuable only when they have spent time with the startups on an ongoing basis to understand the business, to provide advice to the businesses, seeing how it works, and then go back again. So there's actually true engagement as opposed to the one-off or you know, once a month or once in every two months kind of a meeting. So that's exactly one of the risks that we have attempted to mitigate by assigning three mentors to a, a startup and continuing with that for four months. Yeah, actually, to, to comment on that, so uh, I totally agree. And actually, when we started, we had between three and five mentors assigned to a startup. And then we saw this uh, mentor's whiplash that you mentioned, and we, we changed it. Uh, so we have now only one uh, or two mentors. Actually, it'll be mostly one mentor, which we call, actually, we divide the mentors into two categories. Um, the first category will be lead mentors or all hands mentors. These will be usually uh, serial entrepreneurs who's gone through the ups and downs of uh, building a startup, uh, building a startup, and then there'll be expert mentors which have some expertise in some specific domain. So the all hands mentor will go with the company from day one to the end. Uh, he's like a family doctor, and and when when you need some uh, expertise, he'll call some other mentor for a week, two or three, to help them in a specific domain in marketing and and. Uh, pricing and financing, I, I, I don't know, you know, in biz dev and all these kind of stuff. And then the expert mentor will work for two or three weeks with the company, with a company. And then uh, he or she will be available to work with other companies for another two or three weeks per need. So we're kind of trying to play with that. Actually, we got the feedback. We're doing customer development on ourselves. So we see ourselves as a product. And then we talk with the startups to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, and for most of them, this change worked pretty nicely. Uh, but I must say that for some of them, um, uh, they want to hear more opinions before they can decide. So you know, it, it really varies. There is no good and bad. It's uh, you know, that's that's an experience, and it can work that way or another. And then uh, at the University of Washington with Commotion, since these uh, startups are coming from the University of Washington's labs, they've actually been around our team of entrepreneurs and residents since the very beginning when they disclose their ideas. So as they're um, creating their ideas and going through the process, the startup process, they have been surrounded by uh, an entire environment of entrepreneurs and residents that are always available to them throughout their entire journey from the ideation stage uh, to the development stage all the way through through the um to the growth stage. So again, we also agree that this flyby model, I think at times it's really helpful depending if there's an in, uh, area expert um, that you need, but to have that relationship building that can take even years. So one of the pleasures at the incubator is that we don't have a time frame with the different clients. So we'll have the same cohort in for sometimes years, depending on what is their appropriate graduation rate. So um, one of our biotech companies is in there for three years right now, um, since basically the beginning of the incubator. And they're looking to spin out maybe in another uh, six months. Um, but so we actually get to have that long-term relationship, which actually helps foster them to that next phase. Um, so incubators have a little bit different of a model than we've heard from the accelerators, where it can be years uh, relationship status rather than that six months, nine months um, time frame. We are getting close to the, I think we've got about time for one more um, question. And what I'd like to ask is we've got such a great uh, varied, uh, you know, we've got such a wide, vary, uh, wide array of, uh, of, of different organizations out there. What are some of the, diff the key differences? And I, I think I'd, I'll start with Rebecca, but I'd love to hear um, from all of you uh, between, um, you know, more uh, private uh, accelerators like, uh, like Nine Mile, um, versus uh, a more corporate uh, accelerator like Microsoft. Uh, for example, does um, Microsoft has a lot of key 
uh, partners and you know uh, market connections that they can leverage. But is it is it important, for example, Hanan, for um, for the companies to utilize micro, uh, Microsoft's technology stacks in the products and services that they produce? To recap, I sort of commented on some of the unique attributes of each of these programs, right? Whether it's domain focus, global reach, or investor traction, they all have their own flavors. The only thing I'll maybe chime on in now is that when it comes to sort of what is the role of, of government in this ecosystem, um, you know, we're actually pretty scrappy in, in terms of how we, we fund our own resources. And so um, we're not running incubators. We're not investing in co-working spaces. We're not investing in companies. We leave that to the experts. So um, what our goal is, is to sort of aggregate you know, all the resources that are out there, curate those that are appropriate for each of our audiences, serve as a megaphone for, for them as, as much as we can. And ultimately, the role of government, I think, in, in this space is to be the convener. As the sort of Switzerland neutral party, we have this really unique opportunity to get folks around the table. I mean, you've done that tonight. You've got some, you know, great, great folks here in the space. But we can, you know, get Amazon, Google, Facebook and Microsoft in the same room together working on civic issues. It's, it's pretty amazing. And so, so I think that's our role is to be the conveners, um, to be the, the aggregators, curators, promoters, to be the matchmakers and coaches and really um, just shorten that path and find them the best resource, whether it's one of these folks or the other 147 that we list on our website. That's our job. We're kind of traffic cops. So, you know what? Since we did kind of cover that a little bit, uh, I'd love to close on, I, I think it is so unique that the city of Seattle has a director of entrepreneurship and technology. I mean, that is a very you know impressive thing. I, I've been, I've lived in a, many different cities, and the reason that I came to Seattle is because of its thriving scene, and and that they we you know that they the the, the city and state put such an emphasis on that. So. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, resources out there or places to find information about uh, a lot of the private resources, but is there anything that the, the, the state or the city is doing um, that might not be as well known about that, that, that entrepreneurs should know about? Uh, any type of uh, specific programs or uh, events or anything like that? Probably not so much at the city level. I mean, every industry is different. You know, we have a restaurant advocate who helps new business owners in that space navigate the 17 sets of permits they have to obtain to open a business, right? So every industry has its own challenges, and so our various sector advocates are there to address those unique needs. You know, in the world of startup, uh, probably no surprise, the issues over 350 meetings that I've had in the last 18 months, guess what? Our gosh, I've got team issues, or I'm struggling with my co-founder, or I really need help with go-to-market strategy, or investigate, you know, in, uh, navigating the investment or accelerator or incubator landscape. I mean, these are the classic issues that keep every entrepreneur up at night. And so, so we, you know, have sort of tailored our program to identify the, the quickest way to, you know, to enable them um, a path to success. I would say, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the big, the, the challenging the work, work that we have as a city and a state is to address um, the issue of talent. You know, we convened a roundtable with startups and big tech companies, the, the mayor's first sort of industry conversation, and the two things they wanted to talk about were talent and traffic. <laughs> so we have, you know, we are one of the, and we have actual like LA style traffic. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. And so we're at this really interesting inflection point as a city where, you know, a lot of it is driven by the tech boom. We have this unprecedented, you know, period of growth and construction. And there's, uh, there's a downside to that. One um, is housing prices and transportation. And another is, you know, th this disparity and that not everyone in the community has had equal access and so as a government we need to figure out how to fix education like how are we going to get computer science uh, education you know stem into the hands of every citizen across every public school across our city and state we're not there yet and until or unless we are um, giving access and opportunity to our own youth to participate in this um, you know we're gonna we're gonna bump into some trouble that our, our growth will be throttled by a lack of talent and how unique is it uh 
compared to other cities for uh, for Seattle to be putting such an emphasis on this and have the you know carve out these type of roles and, and these focuses? Yeah, I mean the the challenges of growth that we're facing are not unique. You know, we certainly look to San Francisco as being the hub of, of tech entrepreneurship, and they've been a role model. But they're also now a bit of a cautionary tale, right? So so we are we look around the country um, to see you know what to do and what not to do. Um, in terms of um, the the startup advocate role, that was that was pretty new. Um, it's it's only 13% of cities around the globe that have any infrastructure for listening to you, for listening to entrepreneurs and innovators. And that is part of our job, is to listen to you because you know best about what what is throttling your growth. And so part of the role in listening to entrepreneurs is both to help solve their problems, but also to sort of recognize systemic issues and bubble up sort of policy recommendations so that we can make big systemic changes. It, it has been new. And so I've heard in you know the last year from Spokane and Bellevue and San Diego and Barcelona and Chile and South Korea and Japan, like, how did you do it? Like, what are you doing? Um, and so it's been really fun to be sort of, you know, on, on the forefront of those conversations. But I know there are other cities um, like Philadelphia. They have a startup PHL program that, you know, we're constantly comparing notes and sharing best practices and kind of like what these guys were saying. Um, yeah, we compete for talent. We compete to be the global hub of entrepreneurship. But we learn from each other and collaborate as well. Just to two comments on uh, what you mentioned. So I think one of the cities that has a role like you is Tel Aviv. And if, if you need a connection in there, I'll be more than happy with that. Um, um, and by the way, uh, probably it's, it's a phenomena that when tech rises, the uh, housing also gets very expensive. It happened also in Tel Aviv. Uh, so I don't know how to solve this, but it, you know, it's a phenomena. Another comment on what you said, I think there is a huge resource or huge tech talent uh, uh, resource in here. So we have obviously Microsoft and Amazon and we have Google and Facebook and, and Apple. All of them come over here. I think what this city is missing um, is more the education and the uh, uh, help to, to get them into an entrepreneurship mode. Because they work in big companies and they are happy in big companies and, and there is a, a lot of tech talent here but someone needs to take them uh, out of these companies, out of these big corporates, and open startups. And this doesn't happen here a lot. So and that's where Startup Hall it, came from. Well, and yeah. also with Commotion, exactly. too, is that, I mean, that is part of our mindset, uh, part of our mission is to really connect these tools and resources to create this innovative mindset, um, not just across campus and in the students and in our faculty, but across the city, uh, you know, across the region, um, across the state. Uh, so absolutely, Startup Hall, as Rebecca was mentioning, um, sort of came through to, uh, as we're seeing with all the innovation districts right now across the nation, is that you need that university mixed in next to the students, next to the anchor tenants, and creating that proximity so that you can have that um, collision effect. Collision effects create uh, lots and lots of different innovations, right? Because uh, you have the recipe there for all the elements. Um, so uh, Star Paul was created so that we could actually have outside industry have a place to um, locate themselves next to campus and get interconnected in with the campus, but also bringing the campus out into uh, the rest of the city as well. So it's a two-way avenue. Um, but uh, right now, it's one floor um, that you can think of as Star Paul, but Comotion is really looking at the entire district of how do we create this innovation district where it's not just at the U district, um, but across the entire region. Um, so lots of really fun stuff coming out of UW. We definitely are looking at partnerships. Um, we can't announce any yet, but there's a lot of great partnerships that are coming uh, down the pike that are all about how do we create this mindset? Because it is the new sense, right? Startups will come and go. Um, you know, uh, the statistic is that after five years, uh, you have a 50% chance of success rate. Um, so all of our jobs are how do we make sure that that sixth year you are surviving. Um, but even if they don't, the whole point is that you've just created this education where you've gone through this tactic um, uh, experience into entrepreneurship. And that mindset will help even at the larger corporations with an entrepreneurship mindset. So really, we see it as a win-win all around. Um, and 
definitely um, seeing the impact there. So I think stay tuned for a lot of wonderful stuff that's coming out of University of Washington. Again, uh, as Rebecca was saying, we are uh, the leader uh, in the top leaders with MIT and Stanford and Harvard. So we're all in good company, all in fun partnerships uh, to being the most innovative universities in the globe. So uh, we're definitely working there and, and uh, having an emphasis in there. Well, on the note, uh, like Rebecca said, we are, you know, the, the whole point here is to, to be listening to you guys, and we are, this event, everybody here is, is here for you. Um, so let's, let's start to turn it over to questions and answers. Uh, does anybody have, would anybody like to start? Can I judge your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick question for promotion. Do you do anything to Uh, so STTR, um, you're talking about the federal uh, uh, funding source, is that correct? Okay, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, we do definitely actually have a person at Comotion that is focused in on SBIR, STTR funding. Um, so uh, uh, we do definitely look at that. There is also Office of um, Sponsored Research. So there's lots of different ways to interact with the University of Washington. So if you're a company and a startup and you want to interact with one of our professors, I would definitely say Office of um, uh, Sponsored Research would be number one. Number two would be in the Comotion website, there's a woman named Jeanette Ennis, uh, and she's my colleague. I, fantastic woman that is um, leading the SBIR, STTR uh, funding program for Commotion. So two resources definitely connect in with um, that can definitely help you. And that's what we're looking for. Not just large corporation and partners, but also the startup partnerships as well. Hi. Hi. My question is for Hannon. Uh, I heard you say that you help the startups and uh, you don't have an equity in the startup as well. But I was curious to find out, so what is your stake in, in the process? Yeah, that, that's the, you know, if I talk to one person or to 100, there'll be always one question, what's in it for Microsoft? <laughs> uh, so what's in it for Microsoft? Um, we would like to be, uh, so I'll start from a different, uh, a different angle. So um, as you probably know, um, Today's enterprise, or many of today's enterprise, started as very small startups a few years ago, not so many years ago. Like, think about Dropbox and, and Netflix and Facebook and, you know, all these kind of startups that trade into uh, big corporates and big enterprises. Uh, Microsoft eventually is a, a company that uh, builds itself around partnerships uh, with other enterprises. So for us, working with the next five years uh, of uh, new enterprises starts here, starts with startups uh, all around the world. Uh, statistics shows that uh, at least in the last 90 months, if I'm not mistaken, there were established more than uh, 100 uh, companies that are valued of more than $1 billion. So every month, more than one company or one startup around the world somewhere uh, starting and will be a $1 billion company, you know, in, in a few years. So we would like to be part of this, uh, um, of this partnership, of this ecosystem. Uh, and that's the reason we're, uh, we're doing all of that. So we're not seeing or looking for immediate ROI. Uh, I, like, I like to say that on the p &L number, you know, on the p and I'm on the L side. <laughs> um, because we're not looking at to, to make any kind of immediate revenues, but eventually, um, we're not doing that for philanthropic reasons uh, only. You know, we're very happy to give to the community and create ecosystems all around the world. But uh, for us, being a major player in these ecosystems of startups, will create our advocates out there that eventually, eventually, will create for us more partnerships uh, and more companies to work with in the future that will appreciate what we do for them now. So that's the reason. Uh, first, uh, thank for the panel for the good talks. And um, uh, actually, at first, I wanted to ask a question that uh, you just asked. Mm -hmm. But it's good that uh, so it's good that um, Microsoft uh, might not take any equity, but look for like uh, collaboration later. Uh, so uh, <coughs> my question is, um, uh, what? Uh, so could you talk more about the criteria to get into? Um, Microsoft Venture Accelerators, like uh, what's, what's the state of the company, uh, like the size, the, 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 
uh, the state of the product, the company. So what's the criteria to get? Yeah, so, so I'll explain about the entire process. So um, out of the 500 companies that apply to the program, um, we're re the application is on, on a website, of course, and uh, we'll go for every single one of them and read it, you know, down, bottom up and down, you know, from, we'll read it all. Uh, we won't miss uh, a word in there because we really want to make sure um, we're looking for the uh, uh, right companies. Now, um, out of them, uh, we will interview, most of the, interv the initial interviews will be on a phone, Skype, um, with around uh, 200 of them, and then we go down the list with deeper interviews. Um, eventually, we'll shortlist 40 companies that we will invite for a full day, we call it jury day, uh, in which the companies will present uh, to us, but mostly to um, uh, non-Microsoft people, like investors and mentors and experts in the industry. And then we will select out of these 40, we'll select the 10 to 15 Audi criteria. So we're looking for companies um, that have at least a proof of concept uh, in the product. Uh, they may have customers, but you know, not necessarily paying customers or not. If you know, both are okay. Uh, we're looking for teams. Um, we usually we very hard. Um, it'll be very hard to get into our program with uh, one entrepreneur uh, doing everything on, on his own. Uh, so we're looking for teams that work together for at least quite a few months so we can see that the team is sticking together, gone, uh, has gone through ups and downs, uh, because we know they'll go through ups and downs uh, during their life, so we need to know that they stick together. Uh, they need to strive or to look for uh, an idea that will bring them to be a, a, a big company. So we're looking to uh, into companies that solve big pains. Um, we used to say that we'll look into company, uh, $1 billion companies. Uh, I'm not really sure because, you know, we're, we've taken companies that are less than that. But again, um, uh, we're looking for big, uh, big pains being solved. Um, and uh, um, eventually, we would like to see the, the technology there, uh, because we can bring a lot of help with the technology. Um, we would like to see some sort of technological rather than just a marketing kind of stuff. So um, companies like, I don't know, uh, Angry Birds would probably not qualify, although they are su really successful ones. Uh, so we would have missed them. But you know, we, we wouldn't have taken them for these kind of reasons. And we are totally aware of that. There will be great companies out there that will not just will just not fit to what we're looking for. And that's OK. Um, so these are the, uh, the criteria of, uh, of selection. Again, it, it varies across locations. Uh, regarding funding, by the way, that I haven't mentioned, so we'll be looking for companies uh, that raised uh, around one to one and a half million dollars, although we're not disqualifying companies that haven't raised any money. So it's always zero to um, zero to one and a half million dollars uh, in funding. Um, we really appreciate companies that are uh, working with no funding, uh, bootstrapping for a long time and can show results without funding. Uh, we, we would definitely look at that. One quick word of endorsement for the Microsoft Ventures Accelerator. If you have achieved product market fit, and all you're looking for is, uh, I mean, the, the one thing that separates you from success is customer acquisition and customer traction, I don't think there's a better option. They're not. They're giving you money, some money. They're actually not taking equity, and they're going to go introduce you to customers. How much better does it get? So I definitely. Thank, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Highly it. recommend it. So uh, I, I'm uh, bootstrapping right now, and I, there's a lot of pains in the consumer sector for insurance. Uh, at, for, for myself and my two other uh, co-workers that are working in big companies, can you tell Rebecca and, and Elizabeth, can you tell me about resources that someone that doesn't want to go through Accelerator, uh, but I want, I want to find like a mentor, perhaps, and what are the a avenues I can do? Where can I go to find them? Yeah, so a um, couple of things. I would sort of even pull it back a little bit. Um, asking someone to be your mentor is a really big and kind of squishy ask. And so I think that, you know, m my advice would be 
really put some guardrails around it, you know, and, and these guys talked a little bit about having those subject matter experts. So ask yourself, what problem are you trying to solve with a mentor? Is a mentor the right fit for you? Or are you looking for, you know, to, to have a vendor or service provider help you with your financials? Or are you looking to actually have a long-term relationship with somebody who joins your advisory board and gets a piece of equity in your company? So just be, you know, fanatical about asking yourself what specific problem you're trying to solve for. Um, I've certainly, you know, personally outside of my city role, developed mentoring relationships with businesses over time, but it has always started with a cup of coffee where they ask for 20 minutes and ask a very specific question because that makes it really easy for me to say yes. Um, generally, if somebody says, will you be my mentor? I say no because I don't want to disappoint them because I don't know what exactly they're looking for. So start with a small and specific ask would be my recommendation. I think if you're sort of wanting to keep your day job and moonlight, I would absolutely recommend um, just experiential learning that you get at a startup weekend. It's 54 hours out of your life. And again, it's creating those collisions and that serendipity where you meet other like-minded people where you know real authentic sort of sticky relationships can grow. Um, programs, the pre-accelerator like Next um, and even Founder Institute are um, designed to enable you to keep your day jobs and they just run evening programs. They're high commitment. You know, it will take over your life if you're sort of trying to juggle uh, you know, both of these priorities but you know they have more formal um, mentorship programs that still enable you to, to keep that day job. Um, and one of my other uh, great avenues is, of course, the Startup Seattle website, and they have tons of events. Uh, so I would definitely say check out the events and the networking, lots of meetup groups. Um, one of my favorite apps is the Weave app, um, where you can actually go through and figure out, um, and you can have specific asks that you find people who are in your discipline area or someone that you're wanting uh, in an area that you need, and you can actually ask them a question of, hey, you know, can you meet for coffee? And you can start that relationship. Um, there's actually a lot of really good events around town about mentorship. Um, uh, Grace is in the audience, and we are part of the Women in Bio uh, board. And we've actually done panel discussions on how do you um, approach mentorship relationships. So I would actually do uh, a lot of education on what does that relationship look like? What are some expectations? How do you make those successful so you don't um, fatigue your mentor? Or a lot of these asks, because if you ask someone uh, to be a mentor, that is a social um, capital that you've given up um, and you've uh, exchanged. So make sure that you respect that time and, and there's some good um, best practices out there. So definitely I would say brush up on that, but connect in with all the different events around town and start getting to know people and you'll start creating those relationships where people will want to help you solve your problems because they're so excited about them. Hello, uh, Brian Rivera here. Came all the way down from Auburn, Washington. Um, this question is for Rebecca. Uh, how many of the resources available for startups are in different languages other than English? And is that important? That is an excellent question. And I would say probably where we're strongest is in the restaurant um, sector. So we have um, our restaurant success portal that um, I believe we have translated into Spanish and Mandarin at this or Chinese at, at this point um, online. Uh, that's a growth opportunity for us. Um, we do have. Um, but we do have a couple of offices within the city that provide those services. So as needed, we can connect with them and bring translators with us to meetings. But I think there is a significant opportunity there. I would say, again, best practices is in the restaurant industry. But if you look at the demographics, the changing demographics of Seattle, um, we have, and we talked about this the other day, we, uh, have one of the most diverse zip codes in the country, and that's zip code 98118, where 105 languages are spoken. We now have more East Africans living in Seattle than we do African Americans. So we have an, an incredible influx of immigrants who have um, a disproportionately high rate of entrepreneurship. It is incumbent upon us to provide those services in multiple languages, and we're tipping away at it, so we don't have sort of dedicated resources per program, but um, as a city, um, we have uh, you know, the Office of Immigrant Affairs and Office of Civil Rights and, and resources we can leverage as needed, but I'd love to see us continue to grow that. Great question, thank you. So this, this is for Zenjay or uh, Hanan. You guys say that your organizations are targeting B2B. I'm in the consumer side. What organizations in Seattle will support a consumer side uh, startup? 
Um, I would, um, uh, back to Rebecca's point, I, I think of a lot of these organizations as a stepping, a step function. I think you potentially start off with Startup Next. Um, again, they don't take any equity. They provide about a 16 week, right? Or 11, 11 weeks. Actually, there's only five weeks. Oh, there's it's only five weeks. Yeah, so it's evenings and weekends, essentially. Uh, a time commitment is all that is required. The next step, potentially, is Founders Institute. And then Techstars uh, in um, in the Seattle area is definitely definitely looks at consumer-based startups. And like Hanan said, um, you know, definitely Microsoft Ventures, too. Yeah, n nothing to add. So I, I would, I'm not so familiar as you are, but Techstars definitely are a good choice. And uh, for us, uh, yes, we do take consumer companies as well. Uh, again, depending on what they do. I'll ask another one. Um, this one's for uh, Sanjay and Hana. Uh, do you see more B2B businesses changing to B2C or B2C businesses changing to B2B? Uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I, I have a point of view on that for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, excellent question. I've uh, I've have I've never done this statistic, so you know it's on the top of my head. I, I you know it's not statistically. Driven. I think I've seen more B two C going into B two B rather than the opposite way around. Um, I think you know again it's it's a totally hypothesis uh, which could be wrong. Uh, the B2C companies um, are established because people feel pains on their day-to-day -day life and they try to solve their pain, uh, but eventually they find out that uh, there are either some other solutions or not a lot of people share they pay their pain. But they And then what they do is they take their technology and try to find where it applies to other places, which, which will usually be organizations because they know the day-to-day -day pains that it, they try to solve. Um, I've seen a few B2B companies turning into uh, um, B2C, uh, mainly in surveys or things that are B2B2C. Um, so like video kind of stuff that were intended to go to, I don't know, to uh, NBC and this kind of stuff. And then some consumers did some other stuff with them. So, But mostly, again, not statistically tested. Uh, B2C to B2B will be mostly common. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with Anand. Um, anecdotally, B2C businesses decide to go down the B2B route a lot more frequently. But the reasons, uh, in my personal opinion, are slightly different. Um, again, people start off with certain businesses because they've felt a certain pain point or, a, or they uh, have had a problem doing or accomplishing something. But what they rapidly find out is that in order to achieve scale, the only way to achieve scale is through selling to other businesses that then will sell to consumers. And so the biggest uh, goal or objective then becomes how to appeal to those businesses who can help you achieve, who can help you reach all of those consumers. And uh, so that, that go-to-market strategy typically is that point where uh, a lot of B2C companies uh, realize and, and understand that the, the path to achieving that success is through other businesses rather than going uh, trying to uh, get to consumers directly. You know, again, anecdotal uh, numbers. Uh, you need at least a million dollars to get any kind of uh, traction on a B two C type of a business. Uh, those are very high level numbers. Those numbers are probably higher now considering the adoption of mobile and social apps and so on. So, those challenges uh, you can actually address with some of those strategies. Sanjay, can you elaborate on that $1 million for a B2C? I mean, what are all the costs, could you say, that is required for that? Well, uh, 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 no, there's no elaboration. There's These are, again, a rule of thumb type of numbers that you encounter all the time. If you don't have that kind of money to actually reach your audience, um, you need to figure out how you're going to get there. Um, and, the, and the reason is there's just so much noise. I mean, anybody, my 10-year-old can actually create an app. He hasn't yet, but he's been coding for the last two and a half years. Sanjay, let, let, let me help you with that. Yeah. So for the million dollar, probably you'll need 900K to go to market. Um, and, and even more than that, because eventually, if you're not going to create a viral effect, it will not, you know, you, you even have 
$10 million, it won't help you. So, but in order to create a viral effect, again, for the B2C, you need a critical mass, and then it will pop up from there if it is, if it will, you know, at all. Uh, in order to create this critical mass, you'll need a lot of money to seed it. Uh, you need to seed it um, either in specific geographies or either in specific um, verticals or things like that. So you need to be really careful, and that costs a lot of money to, to do all these seedings. Consumers are very, very uh, tough to sell to. Um, and... Uh, you know, my last company was a B2C company. We turned it into a B2B company. Uh, and the B2C path was almost obvious that everyone wants this, but actually not a lot of people wanted it. So. And I think there's a perception among investors that in the consumer-facing space, it's a bit of winner-take-all. And so that's why the customer acquisition is a really expensive drag race, right? So that's not to say that Seattle's without resources. You know, Mavron, absolutely a consumer-facing venture firm, uh, you know, founded by folks coming out of startups, right? So that's their focus. Madrona certainly spends, you know, part of their time and money in the consumer space. And as you look across the angel groups, you know, you'll see that Alliance of Angels and Zeno and Kretzu We'll, we'll do some uh, consumer-facing investments. Founders Co-op is 100% information technology, but 80% of that is B2B, probably for the reasons that these folks are suggesting. If you're curious about sort of who funds what in the angel community, another MIT forum event is called Meet the Angels, and for uh, the last five years, I've actually been tracking the stage and industry of companies that each of these nine organized angel groups are funding. So feel free to connect with me afterwards, and I'll be happy to shoot you uh, that list. Yeah. Cool. It, the man. <laughs> <laughs> In a very non-gender specific way. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions, I just wanted to, to throw something out. You know, uh, uh, something that I see a lot of entrepreneurs, especially first-time entrepreneurs do, is um, they get very guarded about their idea. Um, they uh, are very scared to share their idea with other people. They, um, you know, I think we all know once, you, once you've gone through a startup how uh, irrelevant confidentiality agreements can be. But, you know, a lot of times people are hiding behind them. They're afraid to, you know, take their idea public. And I feel like that might... Uh, prevent some people from joining an accelerator or an incubator or any or even a co-working space where they're going to be exposing their idea to so many other people. It can be very daunting at first, but um, I, I feel like maybe that is a, a false obstacle. Um, is there anything that you guys could speak to on that that might reassure people in this room who are thinking about taking an idea forward to just go for it? Yeah, so I'll just uh, start off on this one. So for incubators, I mean, I hear that um, concern a lot, uh, but what they've shown through a lot of different studies is that it's actually more likely that someone might steal your employee, the talent, than actually your ideas. Uh, so um, I've actually never seen at any co-working spaces someone stealing someone else's idea. Um, but I have seen companies that um, uh, have tried to poach other people's employees, definitely. So uh, that's a great question, by the way, and we get it all the time. And, and here's, here's the thinking. Um, the idea is valuable, don't get me wrong. But really what's valuable is, is uh, the execution around the idea. Uh, if your idea was so simple to copy, then do you think that when you actually start going out and sharing your idea, somebody's not going to come around and spend about three months and a million dollars and just copy your idea and just overtake you? Of course they will. I mean, ideas, honestly, are cheap. It's execution that matters. That's what makes the difference between uh, winners and losers. It's not the original idea. I'll give you a billion dollar idea right now go cure cancer, right? It's, it's not the idea, it's the execution on that idea and how you're going to proceed towards achieving traction on it. That's what matters. So uh, I would definitely leave those reservations aside. Um, there, there is probably some very, very early stage where you want to keep it to yourself, but for the most part, you'll actually benefit in terms of getting employees, in terms of getting potential investors, in terms of getting advisors and mentors on board as you start uh, sharing your idea, your passion around it, and how far you are in terms of your thinking and your uh, and your and your strategy uh, around that idea. 
Yeah, just to underscore your your uh, concept there, I have a recovering attorney friend who, like Sanjay says, you know, I've got a million ideas and I'll sell you any one of them for five bucks, right? It, it is all about execution. Um, what I will say, you know, in terms of so the, the, the investment community in Seattle is, yeah, they're not going to sign NDAs. Um, they don't want to unwillingly sign a document where it turns out that they accidentally have violated the confidentiality of one of their portfolio companies. That's kind of the argument around it. But I was talking earlier about the Seattle nice being a real thing and having this collegiality I think part of the reason for that is that we are really kind of a big small town and that everybody is one degree of separation so part of the Seattle nice is because we have built-in accountability you don't get to be a jerk in this town right and so I think that um, there really is a lot of mutual respect and I don't I, I neither see entrepreneurs stealing and successfully executing other ideas nor do I see investors you know engaging in that behavior just to add one, one comment on that so uh, when you join Microsoft Ventures Accelerator uh, there is an NDA between Microsoft and uh, and the startup a mutual uh, NDA um, we just want to make sure that uh, um, no one even think that we're going to to take some ideas uh, from anyone um, actually there are tons of ideas um, the execution is all so I totally agree with that we have time for maybe one more question, if anybody has one. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't we uh, wrap it up here, okay. since we, we're, we're getting down, we're kind of petering out. And anybody wants to ask a question, come right up here to the front and ask them just face to face.